Hi there, this is Evan de Milner here from the Latinum Institute. And in today's video, I'm going to discuss a paper with you um, written about Chinese, and we're going to look at its application uh, to learning Latin. It's uh, a paper which was published called English Through Chinese um, in English Today, Cambridge University Press in 2002, um, and previously published in 1999 as uh, Communicative Language Teaching Through Sandwich Stories. And it's by um, Yuhia Yi. So I'm going to run through it. And I think it's quite interesting. I'm just going to read to you. And as I read through, I'm going to just make comments here and there. So introduction. With more than 3.6 million pre-secondary school children below 13 years of age learning English as a foreign language in mainland China. Publishers have acted quickly to reap profits from this sector of the school market. Drop into any average size bookstore and you will have no trouble at all collecting 20 to 30 kinds of English as a foreign language EFL textbooks for children, almost all of which are advertised as being the latest in communicative language teaching CLT and having communication as their main aim. Today, after almost 20 years after CLT was first introduced into China, EFL practitioners in the Chinese mainland have generally come to agree with the idea of teaching English as communication. However, CLT textbooks are problematic in the primary EFL classroom. Communicative techniques fail to work and information gaps are found to be not worth filling. This is from Prodromo in 1988 at all. Now, this also happens with Latin. This is a great fashion at the moment for teaching Latin using communicative techniques where you teach Latin in Latin only, um, comprehensible input and so on. But as a friend of mine pointed out this often, after a short time, just becomes incomprehensible input and another method is necessary. So this article by Yu Yi, he says this article presents a discussion of two problems with current uh, CLT textbooks for EFL children in China, followed by an explanation of a rationale for the use of stories and sandwich stories. Now, it's these sandwich stories that I'm very interested in. Uh, they mirror the technique that I have used at Latinum to some degree, where I read things in language and Latin, English, Latin, which is a form of sandwiching. But this form of sandwiching that's discussed here is slightly different. So communication for children or adults. A few textbook writers ask the question, what kind of communication do EFL children in China need? It can be argued that all communication is rooted in need. From an adult point of view, communication obviously means doing things. We're obviously asking the way, going, shopping, uh, booking a hotel, meeting a guest at the airport, applying for a job, doing stuff. Adults' needs, it may be further argued, are mostly extrinsic, stemming from concerns about social position, financial security, professional competition, and so forth. And of course, this is interesting when it comes to Latin. If you're teaching Latin in a communicative way, um, what kind of things do you discuss? Uh, because we want to talk to you so that you can read ancient Roman texts, which means that you need to acquire an entire world in your head of ancient Rome before you can deal with these kinds of things. Anyway, so CLT textbooks for adults, therefore, are justified in providing their users with situational dialogues, problem-solving tasks, communication, skill-building practices, role-play, and so on to deal with real-world problems. Uh, of course, none of that applies to teaching Latin because we're not really interested in dealing with real-world problems. We're more interested in dealing with what happened to Caesar's nephew's slave, which isn't a real-world problem. So, what are the needs of Chinese EFL children? Do they really need to use English to tackle real-world problems as their adult counterparts do? Surveys of various kinds have continued to confirm the whole idea of motivating Chinese-speaking children to introduce each other to talk about Chinese Spring Festival, Mid-Autumn Festival, favorite pets in English. 
is unrealistic, if not ridiculous. A change of focus from the grammatical syllabus with its drill and practice to a thematically organized syllabus with lessons centered around topics such as my school, my family, animals, colors, the kind of basic stuff that you'd also find um, in Latin textbooks now written for young children with some variations, of course, has not helped much to make textbooks communicative or meaningful to Chinese EFL children. It should be recognized that children's needs are primarily, primarily intrinsic and formative. So communication tasks that are suitable for adults are simply vacuous and empty of life, says Prodromul. They have special needs that are satisfied only by special kinds of nutrition. They are, ironically, willing to use English, as it were, not to accomplish things, but to make links with the world of the imagination, as they do by caring for someone, <clears throat> a hero or heroine in the story, who does not exist at all, by making friends with someone, the author of the story, who, although they can't give them food or drink or clothing or shelter, can help them grow by satisfying their curiosity, tickling their imagination, broadening their horizons, and stimulating their creativity. In other words, children communicate to understand things. Now, it's interesting that Comenius got a grasp on this very early on, and this is why he, he wrote his Westibulum, which has got really basic stuff about the real world that the children live in. And he said the children's Latin in the beginning will be awful. He talks about them, the, the word he uses is balbutire, that they will just chatter away in bad, bad Latin. But the key is to give the children the words to use. And it's very interesting that, that what um, Yi says here is, is very similar to what Comenius said. Uh, Comenius was very, very far ahead of his time. Um, and also Comenius also used a form of sandwiching where he wrote texts that were bilingual where the teacher would read out the Latin, then the, the, the vernacular, then the Latin backwards and forwards in a sandwich. So also, similar kind of method. But what Comenius didn't do um, was write stories. And the lack of stories is, a, is a something that I think is deeply felt in beginning early Latin uh, teaching. There are some, but not enough at the very, very basic level. Let's go back to this. So in other words, children communicate to understand things, to get to know the unknown, to play. Let's not forget that stories are at the semantic level, a kind of play and to feel happy. Stories are fun. One reason why Aesop was such a key part of Latin education uh, from Roman times right until it became unfashionable in the 1900s to use Aesop is because these are stories and stories trigger the imagination and children like stories. So they satisfy needs and wants and desires within themselves for cognitive, emotional, social, moral development. And indeed at Latinum you'll find that I've done Aesop with sandwiching where I read Aesop in Latin, English, Latin, backwards and forwards, phrase by phrase. But the kind of sandwiching that Yi is talking about here is slightly different. And we'll get to that in a moment. Um, so development, therefore, becomes the key word from a wider view of EFL education. EFL practitioners must not forget that China's educational policy is still that learners be developed morally, intellectually and physically so as to be able to contribute to the prosperity of their motherland. We must see to it that even in an EFL classroom, the act of learning contributes to the personal development of the young learner. And Harmer, 1991, is positive about this view, stating that a language teaching is not just about teaching language, it's about helping learners develop themselves as people. And De Heer, 1994, labels this development-oriented approach to language learning as a, a pedagogy of being, a pedagogy of having. Um, yes, Adler is very much into the pedagogy of having. Do you have a hat? Yes, I have a hat. No, I don't have a hat. Do you have my blue hat? But he's not talking about that kind of having. In which foreign language is seen as knowledge to be transferred and transmitted to the learner. And he says... Whatever approach we take to the foreign language, even the most traditional, 
We are always teaching more than just the language. What is at stake goes beyond linguistic learning. It relates to self-confidence of the participants. And this self-confidence issue, of course, is something that I address with Latinum. I'm a great believer that one thing that stops people progressing with languages is uh, the confidence issue, that you keep hitting brick walls, you keep hitting roadblocks. And one thing I've tried to do with Latinum is to eliminate those roadblocks as much as possible so that you can progress smoothly uh, through many years of Latin education. Um, so language teaching should be concerned with real life, says Halliwell 1992. And of course, that also was a Comenius's view, which is why he wrote his Vestibulum and Orbis Sensualium Pictus and so on. Using everyday stuff. Life should not stop as children enter the classroom. CLT textbook writers are so concerned with promoting reality in the classroom, they forget that reality for children includes imagination and fantasy. In other words, if you want to do real stuff for children, you've got to talk about unicorns and stuff like that, not just what's happening. So reality for children's reality isn't actually real at all. Uh, fantasy is far more a part of the world of children than what we think of tables and chairs and reality is. And that the act of fantasizing, uh, imagining, is very much an authentic part of being a child or, in my case, being an adult, because, quite frankly, I haven't yet grown up. So, where the learner was or is. Another problem with CLT textbooks for Chinese EFL children is that writers seem to have worked against the educator's adage, teaching must start where the learner is. Eight or even ten-year-olds are treated like three-year-olds. And this reminds us of Berling's criticism of our usual methods, assault the finer sensibilities of our students by limiting them to the simplified sense of structure and impoverished vocabulary of a child. Um, one criticism of Adler, which I think isn't a criticism, is that he uses lots of words, which you may not actually come across very often. But without that... Um, the stuff gets really, really uninteresting, boring. Um, but the core vocabulary, of course, in the Adler course is the core vocabulary you need to handle Latin. It's the core vocabulary, uh, the, the main stuff. And the same thing with Prendergast. Prendergast did a statistical analysis. So his core vocabulary is solid and what you need. But he also uses other words. So you don't have an impoverished experience. So... There's nothing wrong with beginning with EFL words, phrases, short sentences, and small doses. The problem is that they are not taught in any context, being divorced from interests. Um, and that, that is an issue. It's an issue with any language course because you don't really know what grabs um, the student's interest, which is why at Latinum I've produced such an enormous amount of material, very varied material, uh, in the hope that when students ferret around on the site outside of the main course structure, they will find stuff that suits them personally and focus on that. Because if you find something that you like, then you're going to apply yourself to it and spend more time on it and your language learning will progress. So let's go back to what he says here. On the other hand, textbook writers may rightly complain of being in the horns of a dilemma. They start either where the learner was or where the learner will be, but never where the learner actually is. And of course, with an audio course, the advantage is I've got this enormous audio course and you can find out where you are just by clicking on different lessons until you find a lesson that you think is the right level for you and you go from there. Um, no one's forcing you with Latinum to study in any particular order. You're quite able to mess around with it. Something that can't happen in a classroom situation. And that's a great advantage of an audio course structured in the way Latinum's course is structured. So let's go back to this. If they choose a story that is developmentally appropriate for the young learner, interesting, challenging intellectually, how do they take care of the English level of the learner? Uh, for example, he gives an example of a story here called The Hat Maker and the Monkey. Um, three versions of the story for L1 children um, and for EFL children and ESL children exist. Um, and 
many children it's an interesting and enjoyable story and it takes a vocabulary of about 2,000 words to understand it well. Now these 2,000 words he says comprise the form words, the prepositions, the conjunctions, the pronouns, the commonest nouns and verbs without which you would not be able to say anything at all. However, does this mean that EFL children have to be deprived of the enjoyment that stories are capable of affording before they hit this 2,000 word target? And the answer, he says, should be no. So what's the solution to that? So you can do what I do at Latinum, which is to read things phrase by phrase in Latin, English, Latin, which means that you can access texts that are way beyond your uh, level and access texts where you don't know the vocabulary. For example, Celsus on medicine, um, where I do the same thing, Latin, English, Latin. Lots of vocabulary that an average student would not know and words that you're probably only going to encounter if you read Celsus. So nice to know them, but not that important. So the Latin English Latin is a good way of getting to grips with it. And then you can listen to the Latin only and retain what you do retain. That's the sandwiching uh, method um, interlinear using an interlinear text like Celsus. There's an enormous amount of that kind of stuff. If you look at the Latinum Institute website. So um, where are we? So he says, yeah, it would be absurd to try to write a story with a vocabulary of 10 words and expect it to be interesting and enjoyable. Right? This is a mistake that some Latin textbook writers fall into. They try to uh, write very basic books with very few words. And I don't think it really works all that well. Um, Jacobson Tunnel, 1996, in fact, asked the question, can an author write a book with rigidly controlled vocabulary and an interesting story at the same time? And the answer is, it is unlikely because a book cannot serve two masters. Just give me one moment here. I'm going to open the window and get a bit more light. Um, so a story or text, therefore, seems to serve either those who read it to learn the language in which it is written, or those who read it to have their vision widened and their imagination tickled and their creativity sparked and intellect challenged, but never both. And experiments in China, he says, have confirmed that the use of the sandwich method is a solution to this problem. So now we're getting to what is this sandwich method that he is talking about. Why sandwich stories, he says here. Yeah? Um, using stories as an effective way of language teaching is well documented in the literature on language development. As I said, in ancient times, we know that Aesop was a staple in the Latin learning classroom um, and that these stories were extremely important as a means of engaging young children. So it's, it's an old thing, not new. Chambers 1970, for example, describes storytelling as a technique of teaching that has stood the test of time. Indeed, it has thousands of years. Advocates of storytelling as a teaching tool claim many advantages. Fitzwilliam and Wilhelm 1998 for a review of the literature and most frequently met, uh, mentioned being the effective benefits storytelling interests uh, students and it lowers the effective filters and allows learning to take place more readily and more naturally in a meaningful interactive communication context. So with ESL or EFL children, storytelling, says he, is regarded as one of the most powerful tools for surrounding the young learner with language. And this is one thing that Adler falls down on. Adler doesn't have any storytelling, which is why I've produced all the other material in the catalogues to rectify this defect. So while you are learning Adler, you are also looking at Comenius, also no storytelling, but you're also using Aesop and other materials in Latin, English, Latin, which will then give you that material while the other texts focus on building your uh, language skills in a less literary way, in other words, without narrative. Um, so McQuillian and Tse's narrative approach, which focuses on a simple yet powerful medium that provides students with interesting and comprehensible stories, has proven successful in L2 settings for children at beginning and intermediate levels. And Wright, 1995, says, we all need stories for our minds as much as we need food for our bodies. Stories are particularly important in the lives of children. 
and children's hunger for stories is constant. Every time they enter the classroom, they enter needing and wanting stories. Mali goes so far as to assert that stories virtually solve the problem of motivation at a stroke. However, as discussed above, in an elementary EFL context in China, a story methodology will have to be modified before being ad adopted in the classroom. And the same thing, of course, would have to happen for Latin if you were to use this technique. And I don't know of anyone who does. So they, the way that he describes it here, I don't know of any uh, Latin program that uses exactly the method that he describes. Although I'm going to talk about a form of poetry that was once quite popular that does, interestingly enough. Um, so in order to make CLT classes developmentally appropriate and enjoyable but language focused a sandwich method has been used to produce stories with english words phrases or sentences embedded in the chinese so for latin you do it the other way around you'd have an english story and then you'd embed latin words in the english the idea of making sandwich stories he says came to me from my observation of parents in southern china who speak a dialect of chinese using this method naturally with their children to teach them Mandarin and naturally and intuitively using the sandwich method to teach them Mandarin. And he said seven years ago, he says, speaking personally, when he married, his wife had a four-year-old daughter who could speak Mandarin and Hunan fluently. But uh, there were issues there. And all his efforts with the immersion method to teach her English resulted only in hostility towards English on the part of the innocent girl. So she didn't speak English, and he did. However, she enjoyed listening to me read stories in Mandarin, which gave me an excellent opportunity to smuggle in English in my oral interpretations, beginning with 1% English in the story, 2% English, up to 60% English, until finally he was telling stories to her in English. Uh, in recent years, he says... Through my reading and communication with EFL, ESL experts across the world, I have discovered that the sandwich method is also called code switching or diglot weave, Blair 1991, or the bilingual method, Morgan and Rin Walukri 1986. And he says he has been used in foreign language teaching for at least 30 years. Well, it's been used for far longer than that. I mean, Prendergast is a diglot weave method where... Um, although you need to produce uh, the Latin, it essentially still is diglot weave. English, Latin, English, backwards and forwards, step by step. And uh, Adler also, diglot weave, Comenius, diglot weave, but not quite in the way that this works. This is far more elegant. Um, so Blair, the bilingual method, uh, Morgan and Rinwa Lukri, 1986, uh, has been in use in foreign language teaching schools for 30 years, he says here. Best known for the promotion of this method is the work of Burling, an anthropologist at the University of Michigan, who, starting in the 1960s, developed a diglot weave model for teaching reading in French. In the 1970s, Rudy Lentulet, a professor of Russian, at the Bryn Mawr University, inspired by the novel Clockwork Orange, in which teenage characters use Russian words as slang, used this method to teach young children oral Russian. Obviously, he wasn't teaching them Russian slang. Maybe he was doing something else. Uh, Blair, 1991. And Morgan and Win, uh, Rin Walukri, 1986, like uh, Len Tule, got the idea of reading bilingual texts from reading uh, Kubrick's Clockwork Orange. Uh, and they have found, or the, the text Clockwork Orange, and uh, the film by Kubrick, Clock, Clockwork Orange, and they have found it an excellent way of getting beginners gradually to assimilate new vocabulary by setting it in a context that has not been denatured. So a good sustained example in German English is uh, uh, Werner Landsberg's novel uh, Dear Ducey by Morgan and Rinvolukri, 1986. And Tang in the 1970s and 80s used this method to teach Vasa Indonesian to English speakers who had to learn and read this language fast for church work. Berling, 78. Uh, Rin Bolukri, Personal Communication, 1998. So he says, my experience in China has shown that the sandwich method 
allows much flexibility and the problem of comprehensibility and consequently of motivation is solved at a stroke. Now, this is where he tells you how to do it. The how-to manual. How do you make sandwich stories? It's not simply Latin, English, Latin. That is a sandwich method, as I said before, but it's not as elegant as the method that he comes up with here. He said, you select stories based on two criteria. They are likely to have a vital and constructive influence on the young learner's development as a person towards mental, emotional, social maturity, or for a, a Latin uh, um, course, you would use the traditional stories that were taught, you know, the, the great heroes and so on of um, the Roman times, those stories, but you'd use them in English as the main text. And these stories would then develop mental, emotional, social maturity. The Romans used these stories to develop their uh, thoughts and the mindset of, of their population, of the educated population. Um, and dare say that when these texts were standard texts throughout uh, Great Britain and the continent, they also gave generations of Europeans a Roman mindset, because that's what stories do. They contain a whole gestalt. A whole world inside them. Um, so the stories have to have high interest value and they have to be capable of entertaining children. So it says Morgan and Rimva Lucre. And the sandwich is developed by gradual step-by-step -step manner and the percentage of the foreign language items increases story by story until it reaches somewhere between 80 and 100 percent of um, English or in this case you would be you know, you'd start with English and you'd eventually end up with 80 to 100 percent of Latin in the story. And on average, he says, uh, new target language items are introduced at a controlled rate of seven to eight per story. Now, of course, one way of doing this is to retell the story multiple times. And each time you introduce more uh, Latin into the story. Uh, that's another way of, of doing this. Um, just retelling the story over and over in the beginning just three or four words in latin the rest english and then slowly the next telling more and more and more the choice of efl items is made in accordance with the principles of learnability and prominence learnability says he uh, refers to the degree of ease with which with which an english item is acquired by chinese children now we don't really know what degree of ease latin is acquired by English-speaking children. Uh, we have some inclination, but no one's done that kind of research, um, as far as I'm aware. Learnability estimations involve such considerations as phonological transferability, i.e. items composed of sounds and sound patterns similar to those of Chinese that are taught earlier than those containing dissimilar sounds and sound patterns. And that's not really a problem with Latin because you don't really have sound patterns that are too different to those found in English. Uh, grammatical similarity, uh, the simple present, the simple future, the present continuous tenses, the active voice would appear earlier than others. And phrases or sentences in the word order similar to that of Chinese are taught earlier than more distinctively English ones. Um, Prendergast doesn't do this. That's why I put Prendergast as an advanced course, because he doesn't simplify. He uses the sandwich method um, on a productive system, but there's no simplification. Lexical commonality, i.e. content words taught earlier than function words, and expressions common in both Chinese and English, for example, go to hospital, are taught earlier than those reflecting different conceptualizations for example, go to see a doctor. And this occurs in Latin. There are some things in Latin which are similar to the way we say them in English and some things that are different. Um, and cultural acceptability. Uh, culturally neutral items are introduced earlier than those heavily loaded with, loaded with typically Western cultural meanings. Now, uh, with Latin, um, I don't think that's so relevant. Prominence, which is different from frequency, the number of times that an English item appears in the story or in the corpus has to do with the importance of a specific item. For example, if you were to teach uh, Little Red Riding Hood, you'd have eye, ear, teeth, wolf, granny, uh, to the development of the story being used, Little Red Riding Hood. 
For those who do not know Chinese, he says, yeah, I'm going to illustrate how a sandwich story looks by giving a reversed version of a part of the story, Little Red Riding Hood, in which the target language is Chinese and the mother tongue is English. So in this story, the, so it's the other way around, in other words. Uh, it's being used as though he was teaching you Chinese, not teaching a Chinese person English. In this story, the name Little Red Riding Hood, important as it is, is not chosen as a target language item due to phonological and conceptual complexity. So, Little Red Riding Hood asked, and forgive my pronunciation of Chinese, I've got no idea how to pronounce Chinese. Little Red Riding Hood asked, Oh, Nai Nai, how come your Yang Ying are so big? Lang answered, My Yang Ying are so very big that I can see you clearly. Little Red Riding Hood asked, Oh, Nai Nai, how come your Erduo are so long? Lang answered, My Erduo are a very long that I can hear you clearly. Little Red Riding Hood asked, Oh, Nai Nai, how come your Yachi, or Yachi, I don't know, are so sharp? Lang answered, My Yachi are very sharp so that I can eat you up quickly. So, if you were to do this with Latin, of course, you would tell the same story, but reply, but, but put the Latin words in there, in Latin. Um, here, the context enables children to make out the meanings of lang, wolf, nai nai, granny, yang ying, eyes, eye, erdo, ear, ears, yachi, tooth, teeth, and so on. So that's how a sandwich story would work. And then he says, how do you use them? He says, at present in China, in the provinces of Fujian and Guangdong, three types of experimental classes use this sandwich story methodology. As I said, I'm not aware of any Latin institution or formal course that uses this, pardon me, uses this methodology. So type one classes with children aged four to five, type two classes with children aged six to seven, and type three classes with primary, fourth and fifth graders aged 10 to 11 and each type of class says he is further classified into video book classes audio book classes and the typical video book class of types one and two is conducted through the following two steps he says vision a teacher helps review the efl items covered in the previous lesson by in in huangdong having the children act out the story with the teacher as narrator and each child playing the part of a story character as in the case of small classes of 10 to 15 pupils, or in big classes with 30 to 50 pupils, a group of children acting as one character, such as the first little pig in the story of the three little pigs, so that each child gets a chance to practice without taking up too much of a limited class time. Or, in Fujian, by retelling the story with techniques such as intentional deviation, the first little pig built a house of bricks, Information gaps. The wolf first came to which little pig's house? Translation mistakes. The wolf shouted, open the door. The word door means house. Am I right? And for, prevent, prevent, pretend forgetfulness. Oh, granny, how come you're... Oh, sorry, I forgot the English word. Uh, what is it? So children seldom tire of hearing the same story two or three times and are usually enthusiastic about correcting the teacher's artificial mistakes and filling in any information gaps. And then he says the story on video, uh, the story lesson on video, and the narrator teaches the, tells the hard to, part, hard to act parts of the story with the help of pictures. Um, and then children, young actors and actresses, act out the dramatic parts of the story with the actor's narrator's voice in the background. And at the end of the story, the narrator talks about the moral of the story, usually asking questions. And the narrator goes, over the new English items with the help of uh, flashbacks of the pictures and actions previously shown and by asking the pupils to repeat after him or her. And finally, for some stories, a song or rhyme is taught to enhance the pupils' memory of the new English items. For example, the story The Three Little Pigs, a song is sung to the tune of London Bridges Falling Down, which goes like this. Little pig, uh, little pig, open the door, open the door, open the door. Big wolf, warm and your boo, Janie, we will never for you. That's the, um, what's that mean? Open the door. Warm and there, 
our house. Yu Shi La O is strong. Big wolf. Shu Bu Da O can't blow it down. Big wolf. Wei Ba Zhao Liao Da. Wang Zhao Piao. Tail is burning. He has to run home. Um, now, I said, forgive my Chinese. In Guangdong, most sandwich story classes are run on a story drama basis. That is, as a small performance is put on after each story is learned. So after step two, there's a third step, rehearsal, in which the teacher and the pupils discuss and decide who is or are to play which role in a story. And then the teacher helps with the rehearsal to prepare for step 1a described above. And in Fujian, however, most classes are run through steps 1b2, with the rehearsal step postponed until 7 to 10 stories have been learned. And then there's a long rehearsal period, followed by a drama festival, in which the pupils act out the stories in a more formal and professional way. And then he says for type 3 classes, the teacher follows the same steps as those described above. A thicker kind of sandwich story is used. That's a story with dramatic dialogue, dialogues between Little Red Riding Hood and the Wolf in the Woods or in Granny's Bedroom, completely in simplified English and the rest of the story in normal sandwich manner. And a reading aloud session followed by the story on TV step in which pupils go through word recognition and phonic drills. And there are reasons for these modifications. First, the fourth and fifth graders have learned some English, about 100 words, before they come to their sandwich classes. And second, they have mastered the Chinese phonetic alphabet system, the uh, Hanyu Pinyin, so that the introduction of English reading does not make them confused. And then for the audio book class, the teacher follows the same steps as before. So that's the technical part. Discussion. What's, what's going on here? So over three years of experimentation, uh, now more, I presume this is still going on. This is 1999 and it's now 2020. Um, so over three years of experimentation with the sandwich method in Fujian and Huangdong, there has been general approval of the method. Teachers are happy, parents are happy, and the young learners after class spend more time listening to their English recordings and reading their English books. And this, of course, is crucial. If you don't spend the time, you will not learn. Language learning is all about time. Essentially, that's what it is. Input, output. And they have noticed a remarkable difference between sandwich class pupils and non-sandwich class pupils in a degree of willingness to use their English in everyday conversations. They never open their mouths, is a frequently heard complaint uh, from parents of children who don't learn with this sandwich method. Um, however, as anticipated by the advocates of the sandwich method, doubt has been raised about the legitimacy of this method in terms of whether it has any authenticity. Indeed, some people fear that taking such liberties will only lead to pigeon English, or in this case, pigeon Latin, and a corruption of authentic language. After all, a sentence such as I want to chi diao ni, chi diao ni meaning eat you up in Mandarin, is anything but authentic. But the sandwich method experimenters in China are encouraged by three facts. One, pupils are happy, and so are their parents, who are often heard to say that the new method gives their children far more than just English and a positive feeling towards English. And some parents say that they would be willing to pay for such lessons, even if they did not teach English at all, because the stories themselves and the drama activities work wonders in providing their children with the nutrition necessary for social, emotional, intellectual, moral development. And two, pupils are enthusiastic about piercing, uh, sorry, piecing, piecing together a bits of English that they learn from the sandwich stories. Since it's like, I want to go to bed. I don't like Sly Fox and my mother is beautiful, are produced as whole chunks before they appear as whole sentences in sandwich stories. So some of the pupils in type 2 classes, uh, says he, have happily crossed the sandwich bridge to a new world experience where monolingual EFL stories written with a beginning vocabulary of about 700 to 1,000 words continue to provide them with a nutrition for thought, communication, and consequently development. Also, some teachers question the prospect of developing children's communicative competence through sandwich stories. 
but he says the experiments have confirmed the following. One, because sandwich stories provide children with interesting and comprehensible input, and this is comprehensible input is key. It's a, a, a big part of uh, Krushen's hypothesis, although Krushen doesn't approach it in this way at all. Um, comprehensible input for Krushen is about teaching the language in the target language and not using an extra language at all and avoiding the use of your native language. Um, and But this method, Krushen's method, I think doesn't really work. I think it's highly inefficient. Anyway, let's go back to this. This is a very efficient method. As children acquire more and more words and their sentences change from sandwich to monolingual from short to long, the ability to express themselves and to communicate in English increases. And says he, it must be pointed out that for Chinese EFL young learners, communication is not foreign, they're used to doing it, and their initial English sentences are not going to be idiomatic or grammatical. It's also what Comenius says, that when they start talking, it's going to be, uh, you know, they can balbutire, they're going to talk badly in chatter and bad Latin, but bad Latin is better than no Latin. And uh, they're never far from their communicative intent, be it a request, apology, command. Of course, with Latin, you don't really have the social context, so, and the goal isn't to get you to speak, the goal is to get you to read. But language is about communication, and so if your brain doesn't engage with it on that level, it's going to be hard to learn. Stories to children are real, even more real than reality is. And they actively take part in dramatizing the stories they hear, prolonging and adding to the details of the stories. And of course, stories contain culture. So if you want to teach about the Romans and the Greeks and their culture, you use stories. And the sandwiching method means that stories can be made accessible very early on in the language course that would not necessarily be accessible normally to a Latin student until much later on. Um, and you could probably use quite highly developed Latin as well. So they are highly motivated to talk and shout and this kind of talking, although in a sandwich way, is anything but artificial. Um, and in fact, I, I do this. I've, I've got friends of mine who speak uh, French and they speak Hebrew and they speak English. And when we speak, sometimes, you know, if I'm speaking to somebody who speaks all three languages, sometimes I'm flipping backwards and forwards between three languages in a single conversation. Um, it just happens. So that's a kind of sandwiching. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with English, Latin, English and mixing and matching it all up. So if communicative competence is acquired best through communication, it follows that children stand a good chance says she are developing their English communicative competence through talking about and acting out their stories, a kind of communication that is so meaningful to children. And then no matter, he says, how old or how fictional, stories are the best vehicle for teaching everyday language. And that I agree with. Um, and without good stories, um, it's hard. That's why the Cambridge Latin course is so powerful. It's all based around stories. For example, much of the dialogue between the three little pigs and the men who carried straw, wood and bricks respectively can be used by children when asking for help today. And the same is true of a dialogue between the town, cow, house, town mouse and the country mouse, where children can express likes and dislikes and so on and so on. And in conclusion, he says, uh, the article, he says, begins with an observation that current EFL textbooks uh, for Chinese children more for English children or any children for that matter, suffer from two shortcomings in the primary school classroom. Children's needs for communication appropriate to their level of development are neglected. And I think that's true with Latin as well. And B, a monolingual English texts often do not match the actual level of competence of the students. So when Brumfit 1991 says that young learners are by definition too young to have clearly identifiable needs, it does not mean that Children's needs are not easily identified, but that their needs do not quite fit into the picture of needs analysis for adult learners. It's argued that children's needs are primarily intrinsic and formative and must be satisfied by special kinds of educational input, or as he calls it, nutrition. 
children are always hungry for stories that cater to their constant search for adventures and experiences beyond the small world in which they live. And to make primary EFL classrooms truly communicative and meaningful to Chinese children, he said this article proposes a sandwich story methodology which entails the use of stories and the sandwich method to solve both the problems of meeting students' communication needs and of EFL starting where the learner is. And to conclude this article, I would like to quote, he says, the last paragraph of Berling, 1978, an article published uh, in the 1970s, and it expresses exactly the feeling I have now. Preparing materials for a course such as I have described, is a laborious process, but it can have a peculiar and rewarding fascination. It has shown me how easy and natural the process of borrowing between languages can be. And, of course, I have also had the satisfaction of watching students avoid some of the agonies of language learning that I still remember so vividly from my own education. I would be endlessly pleased if others found the methods that I have proposed to be sufficiently intriguing to merit imitation. So, this paper, he says, it's a thir it's a, was a, it's a revised ish, a revision of a paper called Three Problems in the Implementation of CLT to Young EFL Learners in China, uh, which was presented at a second international conference on CLT in Jiangsu in 1997. And as I said, it was republished in 2002 by uh, Cambridge University Press in the journal English Language. And the author, uh, Yuhia Yi, is the Associate Professor of EFL and Director of the Unit of Language Methodology at the School of Foreign Languages, Literatures and Intercultural Studies at Hayamen University in China. And he's been experimenting with new ways of teaching EFL to Chinese children for 15 years and has published four courses for EFL children. And his other research interests include teacher training, phonology, etc. So that's that. Um, and I just thought it was really interesting. Now, at the beginning, I said there is a method that mirrors this, and it's called macaronic. If you type in uh, to Google Books and type in Latin macaronic poetry, you'll find that there was a whole uh, literature devoted to this, uh, which was used for fun. In fact, let me go here. I'm just I'm actually on Google now. I'm just going to type in um, Latin macaronic uh, verse. All right, and let's see. Um, then I'm going to put it into Google Books because I put it in the wrong search box. And I'll randomly select one of these macaronic poems and read it to you, and you'll see how it works. Um, a ballad in macaronic Latin. Here we have. Um, all right, this, I'm just scrolling through till I find the beginning of this ballad. It's got a long introduction, and we'll see. It's going to have the old English pronunciation of Latin, or it um, won't rhyme. So, um, let's have a look. Can I find it? Where's the ballad? I can see, um, I don't see a ballad in macaronic Latin here. All right, let's find another one. My apologies, but macaronic verse is fun, I'm telling you. Um, but um, I need to find one. That's um, good. I'm going to um, pause this and uh, find one and then get back to you. So... Um, Let's see. Unpause recording. Not letting me do it. There we are. I think I'm now unpaused. I'm not actually sure if I paused it before. So you may have had a long session of me rummaging through something in silence. I hope not. Um, anyway, this is a poem called The Death of the Sea Serpent by Publius Jonathan Virgilius Jefferson Smith. I'm going to read it in the traditional English pronunciation of Latin. Arma virumque cano, qui first in monongaheila, tonally squam pushed the serpent, mittens harentia tela. Musa, look sharp with your banjo. 
I guess to relate this event, I shall need all the aid you can give, so nunc aspirate canentai. Mighty flick were the vessels progressing, yactata per aequora ventis. But the prow of the skipper was sad, cum solicitudine mentis. For whales had been scarce in those parts, and the skipper, so long as he known her, ne'er had gathered less oil on a cruise to gladden the heart of her owner. Darn the whales, cries the skipper at length, with a telescope forte videbo, out pisces, out terras, while speaking just two or three points on the lee bow. He saw, coming toward them as fast as though to a combat would tempt them, a monstrum horrendum informe, qui, uh, quae, uh, lumen was shortly ademptum, and so on. So that's an example of macaronic poetry. Uh, in English, um, quite a long one, and uh, this is lingo drawn for the militia. I don't know who wrote this. Uh, Ego nuncum our DV such terrible news at this present tempus. My senses confuse. I'm drawn for a miles. I must go cum Marte and conquisus ense engage Bonaparte. Such tempera nunquam we debant majores. For then their opponents had different mores, but we soon prove to the Corsican Valta, though times may be changed, Britons never mutantur. Me Hercle, this consul, non potest be quiet. His word must be lex, and what he says, fiat, or in the old English translation, fiat. Quasi Deus, he thinks we must run at his nod, but Britons were near good at running a rod. Per mare, I rather am led to a pine, to meet British naves, he would not incline, lest he should in mare profundum be drowned, et cum alga non laura his caput be crowned. But allow that this boaster in Britain could land multis cum alis at his command, here are lads who will meet I and properly work him and speedily send them ni falor in orcum, and so on. So that's a uh, an example by Dr. Pawson. Nunc let us amicae join corda et manus, and use well the vires di bonae afford us. Then let nations combine, Britain never can fall, she is multum in parvo, a match for them all. Um, so, as you can see, this method exists in amusing poetry. Um, the macaronic method, so one could call it, instead of calling it sandwiches, uh, sandwiching, uh, we could call it macaronic. Both of them have alimentary um, aspects. One is sandwiches, and the other one is macaroni, which is more Italian. Hmm. Sandwiches? Macaroni? Anyway, that's it from me. Um, and before I go, I'm going to read you one more. The Carmen ad Terry. Terry leva sumus weary, a yam nos tide te widere, si wis nos with joy implere, terry in hark terra tari, diem nari. For thy domum longst thou nonne, habes wise, and folios filios bonne, socios afros magistonai, haste thee terry, military, pedem ferry. For te tadius may desire thee, sumner et id omnes admire thee. Nuisance, nobis, non to ire thee, we can spare thee, magne terry, freely bury. Hear the praxis proclamation, nos fideles to the nation, gone is nunc thy place and station, terry fear, momentary, sine query. Yes, thy doom is scriptum, mene, longer denos naso tene, thou hast dogged us, diu bene, lose us, terrible bull terrier, we'll be merrier. And so on. Um, and one more by Tom Dishington, sometime the clerk of Crail. Uh, Sacum cum fugaro cum dramibus in glaceo, in hoc verweke est melius quam pipo tobacco, aili cum bicaro cum paibus out of the mo own, out of the uno. Cum pisce creli nominato vulgo caponem, uh, qui de melus um, sisiter unctus butiro. Videris et bifum, uh, cum nose nipante sinapi, o quam gustabunt, 
ad Maria Mores Sericidum, and so on. And then the Qui nunc dancere vult modo, who wants to dance in the fashion, o? Oh. Discre debet ought to know, kickere floor, cum heel and toe. One, two, three, come hop with me, whirligig, twelligig, rapidy. Polkam, youngre, virgo, wees, will you join in the poco, miss? Polka, miss? Liberius, most willingly, sic agemus, then let us try, nunc vide, skip with me, whirl about, round about, kellere. Tum laeva kito tum dextra, first a left, then t'other way, aspice retro in vultu, look at her, she looks at you. Das palmam, change hands, mam, kellere, run away, just in sham. And of course, in the traditional English pronunciation, it would have been celere, run away, just in sham. This is Gilbert Abbott uh, Beckett. Um, they're fun, aren't they? Um, Felis said it by a hole, intente she cum omni sol predere rats. Mice, cucurerunt trans the floor, innumero duo tres or more obliti cats. Felis saw them oculis. I'll have them inquit she, I guess. Dum ludunt, tunc illa capit toward the group. Habiam dixit, good rat soup, pingues sunt. Mice continued all ludere, intenti they ludum were gaudenter. Tunc rushed the felis into them, et tore them omnes limb from limb violenter. Moral mures, nunc omnes nunc be shy et aurem prive mihi benignae. Benigne. Uh, sit hoc satis verbum sat, avoid the whopping Thomas cat, studiose. Mm, great fun. Anyway, that's that. Bye-bye. Um,